Good afternoon to everybody. As a vice president of uh, EIPG, European Industrial Pharmacies Group, I'm very pleased to open this webinar, which has been organized with uh, the te technical assistance of uh, Tecniche Nuove, which is an Italian publisher, partner of uh, EIPG since a few years, especially for uh, the issuing of uh, the, our, our monthly newsletter, which is uh, sent to all our European members. This webinar has also been possible for the support of two sponsors, two uh, companies which are well known on the market, offering technological solutions which are applied in the manufacture of sterile products. In particular, we have uh, Dilama, which is a historical, successful Italian company, founded more than 70 years ago, with uh, high competencies in the manufacture of uh, sterilization equipment. And uh, the other company is a Commissar, originally an Italian company, since uh, two years ago, part of uh, a multinational group called ATS Automation, a Canadian group, which is specialized in containment, but also in automation. The purpose of uh, this webinar, as reported in this uh, front uh, slide, is a focus on main issues which came up in the uh, last version of uh, the Annex 1. Let me show you the webinar plan, because of the organization, we have, uh, I will spend a few words introducing this webinar. Then I will leave uh, our speaker, I will introduce very soon, Francesco Boschi, to outline uh, the main comments of Annex 1. Then we will have a, a, a first question time. Then uh, I will invite uh, the two sponsors, to present some interesting, innovative technical solutions, which can be applied, of course, in the sterile medicinal products manufacturing. Then we'll have a second question time so that we, all participants can again send their questions to the speakers based also on what they had seen from, from sponsor, and then some conclusions. The total time of this webinar could be around one hour and 10 minutes. Let me start right now spending a few words about the APG, which is a, a European association representing the national professional organization of pharmacists employed in the pharmaceutical and allied industries in the member states. And the APG was among the 16 organizations which were recognized by European Commission as stakeholders to take part in the consultation of Annex 1. So APG worked in a team with other, the other organization for an exchange of ideas, observations of, of the last version of Annex 1. Then it was up to each organization to prepare its own technical comments, which uh, were requested to be submitted to European Commission. And this is the focus on, on this webinar. So the, the technical comments, the APG prepared and submitted. But next to this, it is to be underlined that APG also signed a joint letter with the other organization, which was addressed to European Commission just a few days before sending the technical comments. This joint letter contains uh, a few general considerations about Annex 1, and I have uh, summarized in three lines the main focus of this letter, expressing the need of flexibilities to support the use of alternative approaches. This is a point which will be reminded of during the presentation of our speaker. 
Then another point highlighted in, in this letter was the need of a clearer interpretation of a few critical points of the Annex 1. And then the same letter emphasized how it is important to keep a good dialogue between regulators and industry to, to, better, to promote a better understanding of Annex 1. So just before uh, le letting Francesco Boschi to outline these technical comments, let me say that uh, uh, it was the real important contribution uh, given by an Italian association of industrial pharmacists, AFI, which prepared a first draft document. This draft document was uh, circulated among all delegates of the IPG and was the basis for preparing the final document which was submitted to European uh, Commission, taking into consideration particularly the contributions of some experts of, uh, among our members from Spain and, and from Belgium. So I would now leave uh, room to our Francesco Boschi, who is our speaker today. He was a coordinator of the group, but uh, he will explain better what he did in the preparation of the technical comments. Francesco Boschi studied biology at the University of Milan, but also got a postdoc degree in applied biotechnology. Spent more than 15 years in the quality assurance, quality control positions in the era of industrial micro microbiology and sterility assurance with the important multinational companies. He is currently part of the Pfizer Global Microbiology and Aseptic Team supporting the sterile injectable network of Pfizer Global Supply. So I would invite Francesco to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Piero. So good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to talk about uh, the common collections on the draft Annex 1 version 12, which is the last uh, Annex 1 version published. And uh, we will highlight the most important concept uh, that uh, have been commented by EIPG. So yeah, Piero kindly introduced me. Anyway, yes, I'm part of the microbiological and aseptic support team, which support globally the Pfizer supply network. So I have a quite a wide experience in pharmaceutical microbiology and sterility assurance. And also since 2010, I am chairman of the AFI microbiology interest group. And this is my contact information. So if you have any questions also after this webinar, please don't hesitate to contact me. So which will be the content of our presentation? First, we are going to see the UGMP Annex 1 and its revision process. Then we will have an overview of the content of the draft Annex 1 version 12, which have been published this year. And for each of these points, we will review the most significant comments which have been collecting within EIPG. And finally, we will have a look about how within AEFI and EIPG, we collected the comment even in this difficult pandemic situation. So Annex 1, we all know that Annex 1 is an appendix of the Utralex Volume 4, the good manufacturing practices in the European Union. And particularly, Annex 1 is focused on the manufacture of sterile medicinal products, both terminally sterilized and aseptically filled. Annex 1 was, was first published in, seven, in 1971, so it's almost 15 year, 50 years old. So it's a quite an old document. And of course, throughout this time frame, it has undergone through a number of targeted updates. And the last one was published on February 14th, 2008. However, this is the first time since 1971 that the document has undergone a full review because this is not just a simple review. It's more that the document has been completely rewritten and expanding in many, many different concepts. So according to the EMA website, 
this revision is intended to add clarity, to introduce the principle of the quality risk management, and this will be a concept that we will encounter many times during this presentation, to allow for the inclusion of new technologies and innovative processes, and also to change the structure of the document itself to allow a more logical flow. So the key changes, again, according to EMA, are the introduction of new sections. We have brand new sections like the utilities section, which uh, is not present at all in the current annex in the 2008 uh, version. The introduction of the principle of the quality risk management. The document, again, was restructured to give a more logical flow. And uh, it's much more detailed. So it's uh, about 50 pages, so more than double than the current annex. So many concepts has been uh, treated in more detail in respect of the current version. And that's why this document is so important. One of the key concepts of the new draft annex one is the contamination control strategy, which is an overall strategy which embraces different controls to ensure the aseptic process, specifically, especially the aseptic process, is maintained under control. So the plan for the CCS is first to define all the critical control points. So throughout the process to identify where a microbial contamination risk can be present, to assess the effectiveness of the control that are implemented to manage this risk, which from every point of view, from a design point of view, procedural point of view, technical and organizational point of view, and finally to monitor the measures employed to manage the risk. So define the control point, assess the effectiveness of the control, and monitor. The CCS, of course, is not a static document, should be actively updated because our manufacturing process are never static, they are always evolving, always changing, and should drive to continuous improvement. And this is another important concept that has been introduced in this draft, to have a continuous improvement of the manufacturing and control method. So which is uh, the history of this current revision process, which have been uh, running for quite a long time now. The first draft was released by EMA in the, at the end of 2017, in December 20. And then a first targeted consultation was performed. And this involved uh, about 140 companies and their organizations like PDA, IPG, and so on to comment. This uh, revision process was quite a success, maybe a little bit unexpected by EMA, because they had to process more than 6,200 license comments, so a huge number of comments. And about this uh, first consultation um, run, both AFI and IPG contributed, and particularly AFI issued three general comments on the annex and about 40 comments on specific points. And uh, we were very pleased to see in the new draft then several of the comments issued by AFI, of course, probably not only by AFI, but anyway, something that we consider as AFI are now reflected in the new draft. So hopefully it will be the same also this time. Because now a second draft has been published on February 2020, so this year, and the second targeted consultation has been already completed. So it was uh, uh, from February, uh, it was supposed to last until May, but then it was postponed due to the COVID-19 situation to July 20. Only selected associations, including IPG, have been involved in the consultation. But also in order to maintain a global alignment, uh, according to EMA, in parallel, the same document will be subjected to a second target consultation by WHO and by PICS. So from this, we can see that this uh, uh, annex will uh, be probably the most important regulatory reference uh, throughout all the world in the next few years. So not only in Europe, but uh, probably it will influence also uh, GMP regulators and inspectors throughout uh, the whole world. So maybe it's not very easy to read, but these are the uh, part of the Annex 1, which are specifically, which have been specifically open for consultation. And we are going to see all of this very quickly. 
but also this was not limited but also because also EMA allowed the uh, possibility of issuing comments on every other session of the annex with the only limitation uh, in the last uh, line we can see please avoid resubmitting comments which you have already submitted at the first consultation of course so these are the chapters uh, which have been open specifically open for consultation you can see in the slide and these are the most important chapters in the annex and we are going i'm not going to spend much time on this slide because we are going to see one by one so the first chapter is chapter four premises and uh, um, this section describes the different facilities where the septic process can take place and the section commenting what the definition and handling of barrier system which are going to be the new standard now for the septic manufacturing and the qualification and requalification of clean room. And uh, by EIPG, we should uh, comment, for example, at point 4.3, point and specifically related to the part where uh, uh, the annex states that any alternative approaches to the use of wraps and isolators should be justified. And our comment was the sentence starting with any alternative approach may be misinterpreted. So we suggest to clarify how alternative approaches can be supported, especially in existing facility. Because many companies have in place uh, uh, conventional clearance right now. So it should be clarified how this can be supported, at least for the short term. So our suggested text was uh, any alternative approaches to the use of wraps and isolator, especially in relation to existing facilities, should be supported by a documented risk assessment, considering historical data and established control. So we tried also to put some elements that can help the uh, different companies to uh, write this risk assessment, which of course is needed now to support any other facility different than RAPS and isolate. Because now it's very clear the annex is putting the standards towards uh, uh, the isolation between the operator and the process, the separation more than the isolation. Another point that we commented, it's point 4.23, and this is about the uh, sterilization or the contamination of RAPS gloves. And particularly uh, the annex say that uh, RAPS gloves using a grade A zone should be sterilized before installation and sterilize or effectively decontaminate by a validated method which achieve the same objective prior to each manufacturing campaign. Our comment that the requirement of performing the contamination of wraps gloves by a validated method which achieve the same objective of sterilization is ambiguous. So is a six lock reduction required? We think this should be clarified because six lock reduction can only be achieved by automated processes like VHP which may not be feasible in open wraps. So how, how can we see this requirement in open wraps, for example? And we think as a team from the discussion and a validated sanitization, ensuring a three log reduction of vegetative cells and two log reduction of spore may be typically adequate to guarantee that the gloss are free of contamination prior to the manufacturing campaign, because typically the initial contamination of these gloves is quite low. So we suggest to reward as uh, wraps gloves using grade A zone should be sterilized before installation and sterilized or effectively decontaminated by a validated method prior to each manufacturing campaign. So we suggest to remove the reference to the same object as sterilization. 4.29 is another point that we commented, especially about this uh, suggestion to consider the use uh, for clean room classification of larger particles in respect of a 0.5, for example, one micron particles. So as a comment, we stated that we appreciate the removal of the five microns for grade A and B at rest classification, as this allows harmonization with the ISO 14644-1 table one. However, this introduces a discrepancy with the monitoring recommendation where the five micron particles have been retained. Also by this wording, it is not clear if this is a requirement, a recommendation or an expectation. And what we think is the need of considering larger particles should be assessed 
within the contamination control strategy considering the specific process and the specific facility. And if this will be the case, so if uh, considering larger particle is needed, we recommend to refer to the ISO 14644 table where we have all the limit and all the sites which needs to be considered. So the rewarding is for grade A zone and grade B at rest, classification should include as a minimum the 0.5. If the need of considering larger particle is identified within the contamination control strategy, refer to the ISO 14644-1, table one, for particle size and limit. So this is the rewarding that we suggested. Let's see if it will be captured or not. Also the table two, uh, was commented by us. The table two is the one with the limit for the viable environmental monitoring in the different classification. And we commented specifically this note two, where they say that uh, the limits are indicated in CFU, but if different or new technologies are used that present results in a manner different from CFU, the manufacturer should scientifically justify the limits applied and where possible correlate them to CFU. We appreciate very much this reference because sometimes the uh, rapid method have a sensitivity greater than the traditional method. So it makes no scientifically much sense to refer limit in CFU. But what we didn't still appreciate is this reference of the correlation to the, CF, to the CFU. Because this may be not possible for some method for some other maybe not scientifically supportable. So we recommend to apply the science, most of all, rather than referring still to the traditional method. So what we say, what we recommend, that if different or new technologies are used that present results in a manner different from CFU, the manufacturer should scientifically justify the limits applied. So without a correlation with the CFU. Let's move now to chapter six. As I was mentioning before, this is a brand new chapter. And uh, the comments were about the handling of water system and the handling of gas filters. One comment was about the, uh, that after disinfection and regeneration of the water system, monitoring of course should, should take place. And the results according to the annex should be approved before the water system is returned to use. But for the traditional microbiological method, this would imply to wait for more than five days. So we think as a team that this requirement may be excessive, especially for qualified and well-known system. So what we recommend is to reward like data should be available and evaluated by the quality assurance unit before the water system is returned in use. Results should be approved before release of impacted batch. We think this approach may, take, uh, may make sense and also can guarantee the final quality of the release batch. Personal and was uh, open for consultation as well and specifically personal qualification and gowning. And we commented especially this uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.6 and this is about the access of unqualified persons to the clear room. And specifically this uh, part where uh, the annex stated access by this person, by the unqualified person, should be assessed and recorded in accordance to the pharmaceutical quality system. An authorized person from the manufacturer should supervise the unqualified person during their activity. And what we say that the, in, we think that the access of unqualified person should never be allowed in presence of exhaust product and critical components and surfaces. And the supervision, which is suggested by the annex, we don't see as an effective mitigation for the contamination risk, for the risk that this unqualified person can spread, could spread contamination into the clean room. So our suggestion is the access by these persons, again, the unqualified persons, should never occur in presence of exposed product or critical components and surfaces and should be assessed and recorded in accordance with the pharmaceutical quality system. Also, we have this, uh, this is a very specific comment about the sterile face mask, which is now required to be worn in the clean room. And generally, it makes perfect sense, of course. But for high potent products, 
Sometimes manufacturing respiratory protecting masks are needed for the safety of the operators, and many of them cannot be sterilized. So we recommend to say that uh, sterile face mask should be uh, worn, of course, but when sterilization is not possible, for example, respiratory protecting mask, a validated decontamination process should be applied on these items prior to gowning. Chapter 8 is the longest section, maybe the most important section of the annex, because it goes through each different technology which is now applied in the manufacturing of sterile product. And several, as you can see by the slide, several sections have been, have been open for consultation. And our comments were uh, referred, for example, to point 8.41, which is a little bit ambiguous because it says that suitable BIs placed at the appropriate location should be considered as an additional method to support the validation of the sterilization process. So for us, it's not clear whether the use of BI in routine sterilization cycle is recommended. But if this is the case, we think that a validated process should not be confirmed, should not need to be confirmed every time with BIs, which is the meaning of validation. Uh, and also the use of uh, BIs, which are living cultures in routine manufacturing, we see uh, this as a risk. So we suggest to uh, specify that suitable BIs placed at appropriate location must be used for the validation of the sterilization process. But we don't see the need of a continuous challenge and we see also a contamination risk on this practice. We have a comment, of course, on the PAPSIT section. And in this uh, version of the, of the annex, EMA open to some more flexibility about the uh, consideration of the real need and the risk associated to the PAPSIT. And uh, the annex say that uh, it may not always be possible after sterilization to run UPSIT due to process constraint. For example, the filtration of small volumes, very small volume of solution. So we appreciate this more open uh, statement, but we suggest to remove the example or add more examples because we think that the small volume is not the only situation where the PAPSI may introduce more risk than the benefits because sometimes it can be related to a contamination risk, to a breach in the um, sterile boundaries. So uh, in our opinion, uh, uh, this needs to be evaluated. So our proposal is, it is recognized that pre-use post-sterilization integrity testing may not always be possible after sterilization due to process constraints. So removing the access, the, the example. And in this case, uh, everything, of course, uh, will need to be very strongly supported by a risk assessment. Chapter nine, this is a chapter about process monitoring. And it's very interesting that the annex put in the same chapter, viable monitoring, non-viable monitoring and media fields, accepted process simulation. And also they say that the reliability of each of the elements of the monitoring system when taken in isolation is limited. So it's very important to consider the all elements in a, a comprehensive process monitoring strategy. And the section commented, open for comments and that we commented as AFI and IPG, where personal monitoring and accepted process simulation. For example, this is a comment for uh, uh, related to the media field and uh, where they say that uh, these uh, units, media field units should be inspected under similar condition to those for visual inspection that facilitate the identification of any microbial contamination. We suggest to remove the statement about the condition similar to the product, the actual product visual inspection, because some requirement may be different in inspecting a lyophilized vials uh, while a vial containing cultural media, for example. So we think it's enough to say that the field unit should be inspected by staff uh, which have been trained and qualified and under condition that facilitate the identification of any microbial contamination, which may be the same as finished product or may, may be not, depending by the specific process and product. Also, this is a comment about the number of successful media field to revalidate the line before a media field fail. And uh, this point, uh, which is applicable also for one single contaminant, they say that a sufficient number of successful 
consecutive repeat media fees, normally a minimum of three, should be conducted in order to demonstrate that the process has been retired in a state of control. We think that uh, in this case, uh, the annex should refer to the wording of the PICS guide in PI 007-6, which in our opinion is uh, uh, very pertinent because it relates the number of the, re uh, you, the repetition run needed to the investigation outcome. So the suggested text is that sufficient number of successful consecutive repeat media fees should be conducted in order to demonstrate that the process has been returned to a state of control. Depending on the result of the follow-up investigation, this may require the inclusion of one to three satisfactory process simulation test. And this last uh, statement is exactly the same wording of the PICS guideline. And we, we have suggested to implement this wording in the annex. Last section is the quality control section. And the, the section open for comment have been the quality control and the sterility test. And particularly, we commented the sterility test the samples collection, point 10.6. And the annex required to collect samples for sterility test after any significant intervention. For example, intervention where the integrity of the barrier is breached, open door, or an, op or an intervention where the operator is uh, operating within the critical zones. And in relation to this test, to the last uh, example, based on the other chapter in the draft, this can be interpreted as as any intervention in grade A, especially for conventional line. So this will result in a significant increase in sterility testing. And what we think is that to, it's needed that each intervention should be evaluated by the critic, for its criticality, and the need of collecting samples should be managed, should be assessed based on a rational. So our suggestion is for products which have been filled aseptically, samples should include containers filled at the beginning, middle, and the batch, and after any significant intervention as determined within the contamination control strategy. Also in point 10.63, we have that for products that are lyophilized, samples taken from different lyophilization uh, load. We think this different is a little bit ambiguous, so we recommend to specify that sample should be taken from each lyophilization load, also to harmonize the requirement with the terminally sterilized product, where samples should be collected by each autoclave load. And uh, finally, we have a few comments on the other chapters. As I was mentioning before, we had the possibility of commenting also other parts of the annex. So we issued this comment on point 5.5, .5 and specifically on the requirement that the direct and indirect contact parts should be sterilized. And indirect contact parts are like the stopper balls, stopper track, so surfaces in contact with primary components. An existing facility, it may not be possible to remove and sterilize indirect contact parts. So for example, we have isolators, which generally are very good, well tool to protect the product, but in some cases, in existing isolator, for example, stopper ball cannot be dismantled, so cannot be sterilized. So the use of methods, validated methods such as BHP, we think should be support allowed, provided that they are supported by a contamination control strategy and by effective mitigation. So what we suggest is that in existing facility, the last part of the statement, the use of a validated decontamination method, which achieves the same objective of sterilization for indirect contact parts should be supported by a risk assessment and by procedure, minimizing the contamination risk. So as you can see, we adopted the same wording of the annex uh, from the uh, point uh, related to the RAPS class. A uh, couple of comments on the glossary. Uh, in the annex, they are still talking about non-viable particles we think it's not 100% correct term because we know the particle counter can count both the viable and the non-viable and they cannot distinguish between viable and non-viable. So we recommend to adopt the wording total particles and this is the same comment that was issued by PDA, for example. 
Finally, we are close to the end. I would like to spend a few minutes in uh, highlighting how we manage the comments collection within EIPG and A AFI. So of course, different than 2017, this consultation was full in the middle of the pandemic emergency, especially in Italy. So it was not possible for us, of course, to organize face-to-face -face meeting as we did in the 2017 in the AFI offices in Milan. So what we did is after the new draft publication, uh, we left a defined time frame for each uh, member of the microbiologic interest group in AFI to review the document and to provide comment. Then we organized a number of online meetings to discuss the different comments received and to consolidate them. Uh, AFI provided the I2 support for this step. And these meetings, it's very important, were also open for members of other AFI teams. For, for example, from the quality assurance team, from the validation team. And this was very good because we have also this contribution, not only from microbiology, but also from other SIMEs. AFI comments were merged then with the comments from the other countries in Europe, uh, within EIPG, and especially Spain and Belgium, as Pierre was mentioned before. And we can say that discussion managed in a remote way was quite effective and also allowed an active participation of members located in the whole country. Because typically for people working in the center south of Italy, it was difficult to join the face-to-face -face meeting in Milan. So the remote was also the chance to have a broader audience and a more active participation from all the members. And finally, the comments were submitted on time to EMA by EIPG. So uh, we can think it was a pretty successful uh, process despite the, the COVID emergency. And so now let's see how many and which comments uh, will be captured and addressed uh, by the EMA. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, uh, I will try to address it. Thank you, Francesco, for your presentation. I think you were able to give an overview, of course, a very quick overview, half an hour, for uh, getting all the participants aware of uh, the efforts made in uh, identifying comments to be sent uh, to uh, a European Commission in order to clarify different points. Unfortunately, what uh, it is uh, evident is there are some points which need to need the clarification. We have uh, now uh, 10 minutes, about 10 minutes for uh, questions. And we have already received a couple of questions. I think, I think that uh, Francesco can read also on the chat, on the chatter. And one question is about uh, the point you made on the sterilization of gloves in a grade A, grade A uh, area. And the, the criti criticism you expressed uh, in your comment about uh, the need of uh, decontamination and not the sterilization, so the different approach which is to be Consider. Can you comment some something? Have yeah. You, yeah. First you... of all, of course, any of these uh, are not my comments; are the result of a discussion within the team, of course. And I think this uh, uh, this specific point is, uh, yeah, I think more clarification is needed because uh, this uh, uh, the contamination which achieved the same objective of the sterilization seems to uh, indicate the uh, expectation of having a six log reduction, which uh, is feasible for isolators and, and close wraps. And this is pretty the standard. While for open wraps may not be possible or may require, no, may not be possible in most cases or may require the improve, the upgrade of the wraps to, to a close wraps. So, I think EMA needs to clarify, first clarify the expectation. And in, uh, according to the discussion, um, again, within the team, uh, we think that the sanitization with a sporicidal, considering that the bio burden of the, of the gloves 
uh, which have been uh, sterilized before installation and then retained in a grade uh, A environment may not be so high to, uh, to pose an excessive challenge for a manual disinfection. Of course, manual disinfection is uh, still a manual process, so it's uh, less reliable than an automated process. But of course, uh, what we think in the team is that EMA should provide a guidance for all the potential uh, uh, kind of facility. Uh, of course, uh, if you can have an isolator or close wraps with a decontaminated system, you can offer the highest level of protection for the gloves and then for the, for the product. Great, thank you, uh, Francesco. Uh, just in, in brackets, uh, there are a couple of question, uh, technical questions about uh, uh, to get a certification of attendance of this uh, webinar. Yes, I confirm that uh, EIPG will issue a certificate of attendance to each participant. Another uh, minor point is about uh, copy of the presentation. Yes, copy of the presentation will be available uh, on the APG, EIPG website, uh, which is accessible. Let's have some other questions. What, what I understand uh, is that uh, the CCS, the contamination control systems, is, is, uh, is a real new approach. Or, or do you think that it is, could be considered as a different way of considering uh, an activity which is uh, normally uh, carried out uh, in, in managing uh, sterile manufacturing. I mean, and, and, and another question, would the CCS, in your opinion, would it require specific new training for the personnel involved? Yeah, uh, for sure CCS is not a new concept in an absolute way because I think many, many companies already uh, approach the, the, the control and the safety process in this way and also it's a, I think it's a combination. It's, a, it's the, the recommendation of putting together all the different elements that probably are, and for sure, in a validated safety process are already in place. So the personnel, the equipment, uh, the sterilization, the disinfection, uh, the monitoring. So the CCS is uh, to put all together uh, starting from the risk, starting for, from the identification of the potential contamination risk and where and when in the process are located, and then uh, in adopting the measures from every point of view uh, to mitigate this risk. So it's a, it's a recommendation, it's a suggestion to think holistically about your process and to manage these uh, in a structured way. So in a, an overall document, which can uh, be the basis then for the specific validation document. So nothing really new, but uh, as a concept, uh, at least for the annex, uh, I think it's one of the most uh, important uh, new, new addition, new concepts. Yes, and do you think that this uh, correct uh, new well-structured approach can be applied to uh, existing facilities. I mean, if you, if you have uh, some, uh, let me say, old facilities in place before uh, improving, before uh, yeah, changing and uh, getting a new facilities, do you think that the CCS can be applied to existing facilities? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's more, it's more important maybe for existing facility because uh, um, if uh, the, the technology is associated to a higher risk, so to a lesser grade of separation between uh, the operator and the product, I think it's even more important to, to set up a series of controls and uh, mitigations to put the risk uh, down to an acceptable level. So it's not for sure something that will be required only for new facilities. And I, I would say it's even more critical and important for existing facilities. Okay. So if there are no other questions coming up, I would stop here. Sorry, let me check. No, I have some questions, sorry, just a couple of them. 
there is a question what should be in your opinion the real level of detail in the in the real level of details to be in, in included in the ccs document the level of details to be included in the ccs document mm -hmm. yeah so important yeah. of course uh, it's very it's not not easy to uh, generalize maybe to answer to generalize of course ccs document is an overall document so it cannot go into the very very specific detail but uh, i think it should be harmonized with and should be the basis uh, that drive the issuing of the detailed document so it cannot go into the detail of how you validate the sterilization cycle for your filling path for example but of course you, you should find in the ccs the the principles and the, the guidelines for issuing and for managing this validation so very difficult and dependent by the specific process but i think uh, it should contain a level of information that can allow you then to develop the specific document yeah. in, a, in a good way in a compliant way okay there are a couple of other questions but i think that it would be better to to let uh, our sponsors to show what they would like to to present to our participants so i would invite uh, commissar as a doctor as a first uh, yes i'm here so thank you thank you for this chance so i would try to to give a little bit of um the understanding on what we propose and have in in terms of our portfolio for um, the application in the steroid processing environment therefore um, I will start here and then eventually if there will be questions, I'll be happy to take those. So first of all, uh, just a brief overview. I've seen also there are some questions over there where, where we act in terms of isolated technology and all the things which relate to isolated technology and in general barrier systems. Uh, in the API processing, the field finishing, the QA microbiology, and ultimately also in the compounding pharmacy and the ATMP, uh, which I'll touch base very quickly at the end, uh, which will be advanced therapy medicinal products. So in these terms, um, as we know, the upstream on the API, the, the, um, uh, we, we perfectly know, and Francesco before also had to mention this in the revision, in one of the comments, which I, uh, fully understand relating to the high potent handling of substance which requires protection of the operators and um, and therefore all those kind of process which relate to highly potent APIs. So we have a certain classification as you know it'd be five or six. The fact is that um, in certain instance also this kind of uh, requirements is also um, meeting the aseptic processing. So it's the kind of um, application in some hormones manufacturing is one example. Uh, and therefore the isolated technology itself to this kind of application is a basically a unique, um, uh, defines a unique solution for which the understanding on the containment side, therefore to protect the operator and also uh, to protect the product needs to be stay in place uh, together. Uh, the other one, it's on the sterile API. Therefore, all the, the intermediates we needs to be treated aseptically uh, from the beginning. And uh, this one, it's an application, uh, um, as we know, it's historical application, but this is where it requires a more holistic understanding also of the whole process um, in terms of the product itself. And therefore, there could be application in the, of course, antibiotics, but vaccines as, as well. I mean, this is uh, definitely recently in two days, um, uh, very much a discussion and projects uh, jumping up. Um, and bags, stir bags, I mean, let's say all the packaging for the active pharmaceutical ingredients. 
while in the field finishing, which is probably the, the part which relates more directly to the, um, uh, to the Annex 1 um, discussion we are having here. So, of course, isolated technology and in general, RABs uh, are applied to, to different um, application of uh, formats. So, there are conventional formats like vial syringe cartridges, but as well, and, um, and here, um, I think there could be some need of uh, distinguishing isolator and RABs. Uh, I feel always there's a little bit of uh, confusion in understanding when uh, to use one or the other. Uh, I've seen one of the question in the Q&A relating to that, and eventually we can come back to that uh, uh, later on. Um, so in this case, there's also, I mean, recently, uh, three years ago, we, we have launched also kind of a campaign called ModRabs for the revamping of legacy facilities. So existing facilities which don't even have a RABS in actually in light of what the, the requirements of the new Annex, A, uh, Annex 1 was coming out to be able to revamp an existing filling line with, um, with an open wraps. So apart from that, of course, um, application on the new projects and 90% uh, of the time at today, we see uh, customer demanding isolator technology instead of RABs um, for different reasons. But I, um, I would suggest you also, there's a survey which has gone out uh, about uh, two months ago, which was done by the ISP, uh, which basically tracks all the, the trends in the, in the world for which concern isolator and RABs apply to the field finishing. And therefore it's a very interesting publication that you can get on the ISB website and gives a little bit of information on this side. Apart from the conventional format, we are seeing a lot the um, requirements on IV bags and also uh, combination products, uh, which are like, let's say, special devices, ready to mix device. Um, which uh, have the requirements of being treated aseptically and therefore they jump into isolator technology and all the related automation. Uh, one of the things that um, it's important to mention is that when, when we design a new process or an existing process, but we want that to be included within the barrier technology to be isolator, um, we need also to sometimes redesign all the automation if uh, in this, like in this case, are like uh, uh, um, customized um, devices. And uh, therefore, in this sense, um, what the, the whole strategy on how to make that process fulfilling the uh, aseptic requirements and or containment requirements needs to take into account uh, um, uh, not only the automation itself, but the isolator and, and the whole the assembly together. And that's, I would say these ones are probably the most challenging um, projects and realization that we are called in to make. Um, so, of course, uh, briefly mentioning also the QA microbiology, uh, the sterility testing and the globe testing uh, um, as well. Uh, we, have, uh, we talked briefly as well, Francesco mentioned the, the globe um, disinfection and so on. One of the issues on the new Annex 1 draft is also the globe testing itself, which um, compared to the old revision now, it's um, getting basically more as a mandatory statement for the, um, uh, for the uh, application, either in RABs or isolators. So in this sense, this one for us, it's actually something that we're seeing a lot of demands at today, uh, because of course it's applicable on, on all the um, existing plant or new plants and so on. While on the sterility testing, it's more or less what has always been there. Uh, we have launched uh, recently, um, new uh, development project for an automated version of the sterility testing, which are, we're working on as we speak and will come out uh, later this year. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, I wanted to mention uh, uh, our efforts in the um, ATMP. I mean, we know this one, it's a growing trend, is actually taking a lot from the Annex one in terms of manufacturing guidelines, even if um, it's on a separate document from the, um, from the European Commission. And um, so isolated barrier technology, isolated technology are actually uh, going into this direction as well and are actually today supporting the development of the ATMPs, um, uh, which of course, as we know, there are very few of them which are in the uh, already approved and licensed, uh, while there are many which are still going through the clinical trials. But uh, we're actively supporting this with specific prop portfolio. And, um, and I will invite you to, to visit the website for an installation which was done in Germany for which correspond to the largest cell culture plant at today um, uh, in whole Europe. So pretty um, interesting to, to check. Um, I, I would uh, just uh, a couple of slides to introduce my colleagues from uh, Delama. Um, one of the things where we study uh, the isolated technology, and I think um, my colleague from Delama will show that much better than that, uh, is the integration of the autoclaves within isolated technology. So to keep the grade A continuity. This one is an application where we're seeing. Um, uh, actually, in the last three years, a lot of demands in the aseptic processing, either connected to the field finishing operation, but not only, also in the upstream sterile API processing. Uh, so with that, I should be perfectly on time to leave it to Guido, I think. Right, Piero, you tell me. Yes, yes, thank, thank you, Massimiliano. Uh, All right. Thank you for your presentation. Good evening, uh, everybody. And thanks to Massimiliano for getting my lead. Um, as you might know, the Lama is a manufacturer based in Italy of uh, sterilization equipment and uh, washing equipment since the late 40s. So we have been active in the pharmaceutical field for more than 70 years. Where we are connected to this uh, barrier technology, uh, we are connected there since uh, we are able, as Massimiliano show you briefly, uh, to integrate the sterilization equipment or washing equipment or any equipment manufactured by the Lama into an uh, isolator. Um, therefore, uh, whatever uh, is the type of process that uh, shall take place in the isolator, we are able to connect it uh, to one of our equipment uh, in order to make it as a sort of a satellite to the isolator itself. The story began 13 years ago with the commissar uh, when we uh, introduced the first AST mixture autoclave into their isolator. It was a unit for radioactive isotopes uh, uh, filling and sterilization. And uh, the unit was specially design entirely for uh, commissure and uh, ever since we had the chance to recognize that a number of other units of the LAMA can be uh, successfully integrated with uh, larger units or with a different uh, uh, type of uh, um, processes meaning that the Lama, as a maker of uh, autoclaves, uh, sterilizers, washers, etc., can integrate whatever unit to an isolator through a specific uh, conceptual design that we named the magneto door, which is a magnetic driven door sliding that uh, do not allow uh, the, the waste of space. Uh, between isolator and uh, the process unit because of the swinging door. In fact, the sliding mechanism uh, remain extremely minimized in space in a way that the isolator do not change drastically its shape for the integration. At the same time, the magnetic uh, driven door allows uh, sanitization by hydrogen peroxide 
as normally occurs inside the isolators. Another interesting part of the magnetic door is that once integrated in an isolator, the rear part of the doors can be reached by uh, gloves and therefore also manually cleaned in case of need. I'm showing you now a video where we uh, sketch and outline the way uh, normal equipment of the LAMA, in the case of the video we show Noven, uh, can be integrated into, into a generic type of uh, isolator. It's a dual uh, door system in a way that we load from one side, as you see in uh, this very moment. The equipment that you want, the tools, the, the goods that you want to process. And this will be, at the end of the process, downloaded into the isolator for further processing. Obviously, the, the video shows a, an oven, but uh, the concept is that whatever type of our equipment can be integrated in the very same way. Considering that the Lama is able to manufacture, as you might see here, starting from the top down to the right, saturated steam or air steam mixture autoclaves, hydrogen peroxide sterilizer. When I say sterilizer, I mean uh, log 6 reduction in high vacuum, meaning that is a real sterilization for everything but liquid loads. Washers, the contamination unit uh, with hydrogen peroxide, or combined unit, which combine one of the technique I just shown to you into one only unit, meaning that we can steril sterilize, wash, decontaminate in the very same equipment. Then, whatever of this unit, can be integrated with whatever type of isolator using the technology of the magnetically driven sliding doors. So to summarize, we have a sterilizer that can be whatever type. We master also the hydrogen peroxide technique, either in decontamination or, or sterilization mode. And we master the technique of washing. These three techniques can be either combined together or in standalone mode, and they can be integrated into the isolator. Uh, the presentation refers obviously to uh, a concept that is not a concept only, but uh, several units have been already manufactured and sold all over the world with the same techniques. Basically, the idea, to summarize the idea, we can uh, outline three different types of application. In the configuration number one, the Delama equipment, either a sterilizer, a dry heat sterilizer, an oven, a DHS, or a hydrogen peroxide sterilizer with deep vacuum, which is a technology that only the Lama master in, uh, in Europe, or washers, or washers combined with sterilizer, or even a simple Pass blocks can be the entry deck to the uh, to an isolator, as we see here on the left side of my screen. At the bottom configuration number two, the Lama unit can be vice versa used for a terminal sterilization process whenever is required. Exactly like in the case of Commissar, what we did uh, with Commissar 13 years ago is nothing but a uh, regular terminal sterilization process. Configuration number three is instead when the, the LAMA equipment is used as an ancillary equipment to the isolator. For instance, as an example, you have your filling line within the isolator. You want to wash and uh, sterilize the machine parts which are needed for the change format, and you load them inside the, the LAMA equipment, and you re-download them into the isolator at the end of the very process. I hope I have been clear enough with my brief sketch of uh, what, is our cap what are our capabilities, as please feel free to ask any question may arise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rovera, for your presentation.
I, I hope that uh, uh, we were able to, to present to our participants uh, good examples of uh, innovative uh, technical solutions uh, presented by successful companies, which shows, uh, which show, we've shown a, a good uh, deep competencies in, in two parts of uh, the, in two different features. Uh, one is the pro process, so sterilization, washing, uh, and so on. And the other part is containment and the combination of uh, different expertise in, in this uh, kind of equipment can be a solution for sure to, to meet uh, specific requirements, more and more specific uh, requirements. Now, um, we have, uh, we still have some, uh, some time for, uh, let me, we have a few minutes left, uh, if you like uh, to, to send uh, some questions. I think that uh, we have a couple of questions coming up. I, I would ask uh, Francesco to reply. Is it with, what is the expectation of the supervision of, in, of the aseptic fillings? Do they need to be supervised by quality personnel, microbiologists, or for any other area, areas? I think the, um, the expectation is, um, uh, is to have a, a person which is uh, qualified for this role, so which is uh, uh, knowledgeable about the process, knowledgeable about the uh, behaviors that should be applied. Um, so for sure, uh, a microbiologist, uh, part of the quality unit, I think, uh, would be the best uh, uh, solution for this kind of supervision. But I think that the most important thing is uh, that the process is knowledgeable and can provide an uh, effective coaching on the behavior because uh, yeah. it's an uh, important part of the contamination control strategy. In fact, you also uh, <laughs> co commented about uh, the uh, supervision of uh, uh, aseptic process yeah. uh, yes. innovation. Do yeah. you think it is necessary to supervise the whole process or just the criti critical points? I think, uh, of course, uh, the, the critical intervention, especially where you have the, the personnel um, entering the grade A or um, moving closer to the grade A, are the most uh, uh, the most critical part. By the current wording of the annex, uh, uh, it seems that the expectation is for the whole process. So there is no indication in the wording about a specific part of the process. So th this is uh, also what we, what we commented. So le let's see the final version of the annex. What, uh, but I think, uh, of course, the, the higher is the risk of the task, the, the most benefit you can have uh, by the supervision. Sure. But so far, there is no, no text that uh, allows you to focus only on this. Yeah. yeah. According to our interpretation. There is a, a question about, do you see some in the chatter? Uh, yes. Um, I think the description of the whole facility in the CCS, we already addressed this. Mm -hmm. um, is terminal sterilization line uh, can be used for aseptic filling, uh, consider the filling machine installing gray C under LAF A? No, it's not possible because the expectation for the aseptic process is to have at least a grade A and surrounding grade B. So this, this configuration is good. For, uh, for the terminal sterilized product, especially the additional protection uh, um, by LAF is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And it seems an amazing expectation, but uh, no, this configuration cannot be used for a septic process. Unless you have an isolator, but this is, I don't think is the, 
this is the case by the by the wording of the question. Okay. So I think that we, we should go to to conclude this webinar. I have a, one general question from my side to you, Francesco, just a general point. Do you think that uh, the impact of these new requirements, if they will be totally um, confirmed, do you expect uh, uh, an impact on mainly on what? On people training or new procedures to be developed or uh, to change uh, existing facilities or to an impact on your uh, on the process time, maybe you have a, an impact in, due to uh, uh, additional uh, activities to be, to be performed. Just a, an overview of uh, the future with the, the new Annex 1 uh, applied mm -hmm. at the floor, at the floor yeah. side. Yeah, it, uh, of course, the Annex is covering uh, all the aspects of the acceptance mm -hmm. factoring. So, they will be impacting many, many, many different areas. And some of these will be uh, impacting uh, for, the, uh, for the companies. If, for example, uh, um, the expectation of performing the integrity test of the glove uh, before and after each batch from a times perspective. Uh, for, la for big lines with uh, almost hundreds of gloves, uh, this will be an impact in terms of time. Mm -hmm. So the companies will have to, also the technology should uh, help the companies to go to a more uh, quick, uh, reliable uh, test, for example. But this is just an example. So it's very, there is not an area where uh, the impact will be more than others because uh, uh, Again, the, the improvement and the, the new concept introduce are, uh, in, I think, almost all the aspects of the asset process. I would be pleased to, to have questions to be addressed to our sponsors. And uh, I've just uh, received a request about uh, which are the difference between the different types of reps. Yeah. I can I can take that. So, firstly, it's um, um, uh, it will be just two kind of wraps. So uh, uh, it's it's an open wraps. So wraps in in terms of just a step back wraps definition. It means that uh, the environment all outside the, it's a grade B environment, and therefore inside the gra the wraps it's a grade A. While the isolator it's a grade C and with the isolator inside, it's a great day. So if we stay on the wraps, therefore the outside is great B, there are two kinds of wraps. One, it's an open wraps, which basically have an overspill outside in the environment. Therefore the laminar airflow, there are barriers, and therefore there are two barriers, which is the dynamic barrier of the slide over pressure, which in the gray zone can be achieved, as well as a physical barrier so that there's panels. While the close wraps, it's a wraps which is able uh, to basically uh, close everything. So it can have a, um, a decontamination system. So uh, a BHP technology integrated because it can seal like an isolator and therefore decontaminate only the internal part. From a, uh, an outlook of technology, how they appear, they're very similar uh, close wraps to an isolators. But of course, the closed wraps having uh, the uh, and therefore has recirculation and does not overspill the air from the grade A zone to the grade B. Um, the thing is that, of course, having a grade B background that allows to to, to easy the material transfer uh, outside, inside and outside the, um, of the grade A zone. Um, in this regard, however, there are publication from the PHSS. ISP is coming out with yeah. one, so therefore eventually we can provide further literature to have some schematic. Thank you, Massimiliano. No problem. There is a question uh, arrived about uh, uh, terminal sterilization. 
I would uh, ask maybe Guido Rovera to consider it is that the terminal sterilization line can be used for aseptic filling for the same line, considering that filling machine installed less and under under a, a laminar airflow plus A. I, I can't understand very well. Yeah, yeah, I, I just, this is the uh, question I addressed before. So no, it's not possible it's to run a process with a grade C environment, unless you have an isolator. Do you want to comment, uh, Mr. Rovera? No, basically, it's exactly what uh, Francesco yeah. said. Um, the, the way you choose to terminally sterilize or not the product depends on the risk assessment. And therefore, even if uh, uh, you are connected to an isolator or if you are not connected, the way you shall uh, um, choose the, the integration with, a, with an autoclave for terminal sterilization depends really on the, on the risk assessment you run for that kind of product and for the specific application of it. Okay, thank you. I think that we, we can now close our webinar. Let me uh, have a, one minute to add some uh, news because I had a contact with the, the other organization just a few days ago. I'd like to let you let uh, participants know that uh, uh, European Commission received about 2,000 comments this time. So not, not the 6,000 as in the past. It is important to consider that the ISPE is organizing an annual meeting, which will be a virtual one, early November. And uh, they announced, ISPE announced that uh, that meeting Annex one will be a topic, an important topic of discussion with the presence of uh, authorities. So it will be the opportunity early November to know some something more about what uh, the authorities are preparing as their final version. I also I would also add that uh, EIPG, uh, together with the other associations. Uh, has been invited uh, to a, a meeting uh, which EMA, European Medicinal Agency, is, uh, organizes uh, annually uh, with uh, the interested parties. And this, uh, the date has not been already arranged, but to be before the end of this year. And this, that would be another uh, uh, opportunity uh, to understand. Uh, based on, on the last year, uh, yeah, the, the last year um, interested parties meeting, um, it, when, when uh, uh, EMA announced the imminent issuing of uh, the Annex 1 uh, version 12, they also uh, anticipated that uh, Mm, the, there will be a, a timing, a definition of timing for the uh, application of the different requirements, but they did not add any specific uh, uh, clarification of uh, details. So, uh, in, in, uh, I, I, based on what I know in, in our uh, contacts as an EIPG, uh, uh, I, I expect that uh, the, the, the revised version will be released early next year with a schedule of uh, the um, uh, application, the entering into force of the different requirements. That is what I could say as a, as a final comments from my side. Uh, I want to thank you, everybody. We had uh, more than 300 registered uh, participants. Um, and so yeah, I think it was a really successful webinar. Thank you to every uh, speaker.
to the two sponsors for the interesting Thank presentations. And of Thank course, you. And of Thank course, you very much. Technica Nuove for the uh, technical support. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks.